We've been going through a series on things that are fundamental to the way we meet and what we teach. We went through <clears throat> a list of, of uh, things that are, are considered fundamental teachings of the church. In other words, things that are so important that if somebody disagrees with these, challenges these, they would not be able to have fellowship in this assembly, full fellowship, breaking bread, being participating, taking part in different issues in the church. And today we're, we're going to be going through non-essential things, things that are not so important. We can disagree on them and still have fellowship together. But before we go into this, <clears throat> because the, the topic I have today is one that has divided Christians since the 1600s. And I mean Christians, believers, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But this issue has been uh, is so controversial or so um, pushed on two sides of the equation that, that believers have divided over it. And back in the 1600s, some people were burned on a pile of books, on their books, because of this issue. It's, it has done much damage to the church of God, and it has also encouraged people in the church. I, I can't tell you how frustrating it is for me to, to think about the two sides of this equation. But in order for me to go forward with this topic, I need to give you some understanding of my overall view of how God interacts with us. And I have a, the question that everybody always asks. What is the chief aim of man? The end, what is the chief end? What is our purpose? What is the goal that God has set for man? Why did he create man? Why did he create man? Now there's theologians and all kinds of really smart people, not me, smart people, who have who have given little quick excerpts of it, and, and one of the things that they have said is this, Oop, and I went the wrong way, I'm going to learn this yet. Man's chief aim is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So they're, they're, they boiled it down to as small of a, a sentence as they can, and, and what they're trying to say by this sentence is that God created man so that man would glorify God and so that man would have a relationship with a God and enjoy Him forever. A lot of stuff has gone into boiling this sentence down as small as you can so that it's easy to understand and you can say it over and over and again. But it doesn't really satisfy me. It's too small, if you ask me. And so I've, I've embarked on a little bit more of, of some thoughts. The reason why I, I feel like it's too small for me is that if you look at heaven itself and you see in Isaiah the angels circling around the throne of God and singing out as loud as they possibly can, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they're just saying it over and over and over again in the 7-Eleven song of heaven, right? Over and over and over again. And then you find them saying the same thing in Revelation, written five or six hundred years apart. Over and over and over and over again. They're singing the same anthem. And they are glorifying God. God has angels in heaven that are there with just the purpose of glorifying Him. So why do we need man? Do you think we could do as good a job as the angels? Do you think we could glorify God perpetually? I think there has to be more to this idea of the chief aim of man being to glorify God. So why did God create a man and a woman? He has these angels glorifying him. He has these angels in heaven serving him. And I think he has these angels in heaven enjoying him. You find them singing in the 
when creation is made, you find them glorifying God in the heavens when Jesus is born on the earth and the shepherds look up and they see him. You know, I believe that the angels enjoy God. I don't find a verse that says angels enjoy God. I don't find a verse that says angels love God. Did you ever think about that? Do angels love God? Maybe that's the difference between what God receives from angels and what he can receive from a human being whom he's created to have a relationship with him. To have a relationship. I'm going to get this wrong again. I didn't. I'm going to propose to you that God brought the world into existence and as the pinnacle, as the high point of all of his creation, the stars, the moon, the galaxies, the planets, the solar systems, earth itself, the microbes in the water, as the capstone of everything that God has created, he chose to create you and me. And he chose to create you and me so that he could share an overwhelming love that he has for you and that you could share your love for him out of your free will and conscience. See, I don't, I don't find the angels loving God. I could be entirely wrong. But the evidence to me where Jesus spoke to the Pharisees after they brought that silly question to him about the woman who had been married to seven different brothers and whose, whose wife would she be in heaven, he says, you don't, you don't know the scriptures. The angels don't marry or, or they're not given in marriage. So I think that possibly God created man with a purpose in mind to have a loving fulfilling, overflowing relationship with him and thereby glorify him and enjoy him. Enjoy God. Can, do you ever enjoy God? When you're sitting in your quiet place and you're reading and you all of a sudden you see something that's so precious to you about God, you can't wait to get to the Lord's Supper on Sunday and share it. I love to hear our young men get up and tell the little thing they found about the Lord that has encouraged them and draws them closer to Him. Well, so my, my impression, overarching repression, overarching impression of when I read scripture and I study different doctrines and thoughts and, and things is that God wants me to enjoy him, to have a loving relationship with him, to express my love to him, and he wants to express his love to me too. And so I, I put that over everything that I try to read or study or understand. I try to view the scripture in light of that, that thought process. So I ask this question today. If God did not provide us with a free will, if he did not provide us with a free will, so that without that free will, we had to love him. In other words, if God said, okay, I'm putting man on earth, I'm building it in, I'm going to pour into man. You Here you go, here's... Love God. I poured that into man. Let's seal that off right there. Here we go. Shake it up real good so he's got it all in his system. You will love me. That's the end of it. Now, if God did that, what would it look like to you? I had a, a funny mental impression of what it would look like if God did not give us free will to love him. It looked something like this. It looked something like that. You'd be a robot. 
you'd be a robot if you had no choice as to whether you could love or not. If God put it in you and said, you're going to love me no matter what, there will be no choice there. He would be programming you like a robot. God didn't program us like a robot. In fact, that would be disgusting. I, there's one picture there, and I think you know which one it is. I think it's disgusting. Love requires a choice, not a feeling. Oh, there's feelings and emotions that go with love. Yeah, we have feelings and emotions. Our heart and our soul are involved in it. But when Jesus said this, he said to the, the Pharisees, You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Your intellect is involved in a love decision. Your heart is, your soul is as well. But your intellect has to be involved in that love decision. Oh my goodness. Okay. Jeremiah 31.3 says this. The Lord has appointed of old to me, saying, we heard this this morning in the Lord's Supper. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Listen to the heart of God. Listen to the heart of God as he, he exposes the, the, the love and, and desire that he has as he speaks in Jeremiah. I have appeared of old, ancient times ago. Oh, I'm going to say before you were ever existed. Yes, I have loved you. I want everybody to take your arms and do this. Come on, come on, Jonathan, come on, I'm looking around, okay, I'm going to call you out, put your arms around, give it a little squeeze, let me tell you something, if ever you were in a place and you didn't feel loved, you listen to this verse, I have loved you from everlasting, with everlasting love. It's not just past love. It is love that goes to the vast expanse of eternity beyond. I have a God who loves me. He's proven it. He sent His Son, the best of heaven, for you and me so that we could have a relationship with Him because until Jesus Christ came to this earth and until Jesus Christ died and paid the penalty for my sin, I had a brick wall between me and heaven and I could not break through that. I had to have Jesus Christ in my life. His shed blood which paid for my sin, remove that barrier between myself and God the Father. The same is for you. Can you not see and feel that you have a God who loves you in the most fantastic, everlasting way? And, and then he goes on, he says, I've drawn you. I've reached out to you. I desire you. I long for you. I work to get you. That's a God of love. That little squeeze you gave yourself, do it every morning and say, God loves me. How nice. God loves me. Yes, he does. He loves you too. And so every time I get to one of these theological debates or something that divide believers, I wonder, I want to look at it through God's love and how I can understand what's being taught to me because God's love for me is first of all 
And if there's something about what I'm learning that seems to not seems to conflict with the love of God for me, I I count it as something that I need to be very careful of, very careful of. So, the Lord Jesus, when he spoke to the disciples, he said this, not to the disciples, to the Pharisees and scribes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and tithe and of mint and anise. You know what mint and anise are? Anise is a little bitty seasoning seed. It's, it's a tiny seed. And he's saying of the Pharisees and scribes, you know, you are so scrupulous with the fact that you, you get some these little seeds. You're going you're gonna to take a few of those seeds out and give them to me. As part of your tithe, you're so scrupulous about these tiny little things, but you miss the big picture, is what he says. He calls them, what, blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. (laughs) if, If you don't think Jesus was colorful, just read that. Read that picture. He's criticizing these Pharisees and scribes for the fact that They get so focused on tiny little things that they forget the big picture. Now, he doesn't say you shouldn't know anything about those small things. He does say, what's he say there? These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. The problem was these theologians of the Jewish church, not church, the Jewish nation, these theologians of the Jewish nation love to debate and fight about tiny little things of the Scripture and what the meaning of a single word is and, and, and have this big division and debate. It goes on today still. But Jesus said, there's a bigger picture than those small things that you're, you're fighting over. So we talked about the fact that there were that list that I showed you at first, things that we cannot sacrifice. We can't uh, fellowship with people who do not hold those truths. And we went through several uh, studies on that. But we've come to this group of things that are uh, important but not fundamental. And we've talked about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is important. We would not do without it. But there might be different ways that we do it in different times of the day. And, uh, there, you know, we're not going to divide with people over how they hold the Lord's Supper. Some places have different people get up. They schedule them to get up. Maybe they don't have the wealth of spirit-led people who will come and and come to the the Lord's Supper and speak about the pleasant things they know about the Lord, there's many ways that they meet and hold the Lord's Supper. And we're not going to divide over that. We talked about baptism. Some people sprinkle. Some people dip. Some people submerge. Some people do it in an open pond out in the field. Some people do it in a place here in in the stage. We're not going to divide over that kind of stuff. Today I'm going to start, maybe I'll only introduce, it looks like, the subject. There are several subjects yet to go in this series. And the one we're going to address today is this one. Now, I combine this because it's important that we not... not get lopsided on this study. Election and free will. Big, big, flat, big thought and words. I've tried to, again, use the smallest words I can for you. These are doctrines that I told you have, have come to us since the 16th century. And what they simply mean is this. There are scriptures, and we're going to look at them, in the, in the Word of God, 
that seem to say God looks down through the centuries and just chooses who he's going to save. There are scriptures like that. There are scriptures that seem to say man has the complete free will to do whatever he wants, irregardless of what God wants. Those are the extreme sides of this question, all right? I'm going to say that. They're extremist, and I want to delve into it a little bit with you. You can be a, you can be a believer and hold different views on this, these subjects, and it, it should not be a bar to fellowship. However, in this assembly... Because of, how, of the way we have taught on, some of, on one or the other of these subjects, we've had people leave our assembly over it because they could not bear that type of teaching. And it's sad because it's not necessary to divide over this. You can have a different opinion about this subject of whether God chooses or whether man has free will. And you can be in fellowship in the assembly, and you can come and argue with me all you want, and I'll smile and enjoy the, t the, enjoy the debate. But some people get so adamant and belligerent with their side of this, the, the debate on this thing that it offends others. It should not be our place to do that, because this is not a dividing. It does not affect the fundamental issues of the church. But here's the catch. If our elders tell us that we're going to go one way or the other with this instead of staying in the middle, we will not fight over it. We will follow what the elders teach us here. And we will enjoy one another's company and fellowship. So as I go through this, if you think, for a moment that I'm one or the other, I want you to wait till the end, okay? The subject is this, and this I'm going to have to conclude with this because the rest of my message is much longer than the first part. So I just want to give you a little background. <coughs> there were two men, John Calvin, and you can see he was the earliest of them, uh, what was his date there, uh, 1509 to 1564. John Calvin proposed that God elects who he will. I'm, I'm giving a very small, small interpretation of it, okay? Please understand that. Within the last four years of John Calvin's life, four or five years, a man by the name of Jacobus Arminus. Now, just for a moment, let me, let me state. The two sides of the issue today are called Calvinism and Arminicism, Arminian, Arminianism. Excuse me. Not Armenianism, because Armenia is a country. Okay? There's Arminianism. Calvin proposed a very logical, spelled out theology which came to become, which came to be known as Calvinism. And he has five basic points, which we're not even going to get to go to today. And then Mr. Arminius after studying many years under the Calvinistic teaching, he came up with the idea that the scripture teaches that man has a choice in the matter of salvation. And for the last 650 years, there have been battles over these two doctrines, these two theologies. And so what I'm hoping to do is just to give you the bare bones basis of each one and to try to tell you where I think 
time we speak, and I hope that you will uh, think about these because they're important. They're not fundamental, but they're important. And uh, I will get you into it next time, and hopefully we'll have more than 20 minutes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to look into your word. We started a subject here today that required uh, a bit of setup for us, and I apologize to the saints for not uh, being able to move faster than this, but Father, I trust that you would help us to understand one another, to be considerate and compassionate and care about one another, to not fight over things that are inconsequential to fellowship. And to enjoy, to enjoy the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend. And to bring glory to your name by sweet fellowship and love of one another and sharing of the gospel and our commitment to you personally. Father, I ask your blessing on each of these saints. Encourage them in the, in the word this week so that when they come to the Lord's Supper next week, they'll be full of joy about what you have revealed to them. Help us with the outreach next Saturday. Father, we would desire to see souls saved. But in lieu of that, we will give out your word and let you use it in their hearts and minds wherever they go. Bring workers to the field, Father. We, we heard this week that Ireland Outreach needs workers. Everywhere we go, the mission work needs workers. And so, Father, we, we commit the saints to you to, to hear your call on their lives. Give us safety as we travel. Give us love for one another. Bring us back together next week to glorify your son, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.